fucking enraged trying to get this printer to work that I unplugged it and then plugged a toaster into the wall nearby and shouted, the toaster gets electricity because it works. Like I taunted an inanimate <laughs> object because I was so angry at it. I think that's the craziest I've ever been. Um, yeah, it's a little insane. That's yeah. pretty crazy, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're several crazy. years ago. I've become, I think, frighteningly sane since then. Just did frighteningly the sane. toaster get very smug? Yeah, it did. You but look, it did its job, so I put up with it. You look very... Very uh, boffiny. You looked disheveled. In your, in your, in your, in your spectacles. Yeah, I thought I'd put them on. See your, 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 your bespectacled happens. boffin yeah. spectacles. Problem is because they're for looking up close. Now you guys are blurry, so I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm but you look now. smart. But I look cool. You I look, look really no because yeah. you have a bit of a tussled hair situation. Mm -hmm. But with without the glasses, you just look like a piece of shit. Yeah. But like with the glasses, yeah, you look like an academic. Well, I'm trying to like hide like more of my head. forehead, right? Because it like... Hide your forehead? I've got a very high forehead. I look you like do. I've been about to go bald since I was 16. Like the, this, a high you John Lithgow no, forehead. No, that's your no. that's your shield. I've never once had a thought about your forehead and I'm an asshole I'm sorry to inflict it have. upon you. Well, no, it's like if you had a big forehead, I would have been thinking like that's a forehead. Mm, okay. I might not have said it out loud, but like, no. All right, back to standard Heaton. There we go. Took about three seconds. Look at that. <laughs> it looks good though now. Is it? Okay, good. Yeah. Whew, we're Before, back, terrible. Yeah, now, yeah. yeah. Passable. Just, just like, like, like <laughs> yeah. a bunch of seaweed that washed up on the beach. Yeah. That's or jellyfish. Or jellyfish. Or jellyfish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were did, you there we when the jellyfish arrived? No, I was not. Dude. They, they look like condoms. Well, the jellyfish don't. The the man of wars or whatever it were looked like condoms. The Portuguese man of wars. Is it? Yeah. They, they were big. They were very big. So I. Have you guys not seen them before? Or? Not like this. Like when I went. For, so you left for the listeners. We went camping this weekend. Yes. On so a beach. You, on a beach. On a beach. And I was doing a two mile or I was going to do two miles north and then two miles back. Yeah. In the two miles north, I ran along the water, totally normal. On the two miles back, I saw 22 jellyfish that had washed up on shore. So there was like a wave of them. And so I went up and down the shore and was warning people with their kids in the water and their dogs in the water, like, <laughs> they're here. Get the hell out There's of the jellyfish, water. Yeah. yeah, so I actually, it was really nice that I was able to give people those warnings because this used to happen in Waikiki when I lived there too. I believe it was eight days after the full moon, we would get a wave of jellyfish that would come on shore. And when it was bad, it was like saving Private Ryan, just people screaming and running out of the water. And so I think had it been a busier time, it could have been an ugly scene because 22 um, in the, I mean, it ticks me half an hour to run that and they all washed up Our well, that's, what, that's what people get being in that cold ass water it wasn't that cold uh, oh, you're they, just they, a they, giant they, plus no you really they, wasn't that cold they you and i both it. went in we it was fine it really not that cold. yeah it was great my dog went in uh, look just because like both of you were weird dead uh, uh sensory sociopaths doesn't make it cool for other people <laughs> the water was like 70 it wasn't too that cold, cold. it wasn't cold, cold. It felt you, would, you would like Way to live in broth. Not, we, we don't need in look, broth. We don't need to go back to it. We don't need to go back to it. I've made my point, and and uh, uh, humanity agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. are jellyfish like the rattlesnakes of the sea? Like, or, or, or are they more like wasps? Like, because I've been stung by a jellyfish in Australia, but it didn't. It wasn't like deadly. It's, it just kind of. Oh wait, you've never gotten stung by a jellyfish? I, I did in Australia. Seen. Like, the, yeah. there'd be like a kind of like a string. There'd be like a welt, a, a string sized welt. Yeah. No, it, it can, especially if you're a kid, it can it can get you pretty bad. Like yeah, like it'll like... it'll 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 uh, it'll smart for a couple Man, days. And I hate wasps and hornets. They're an enemy species, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. jellyfish are so much worse because if their tentacles get like around your leg, it can mm. be like wherever they touched you. And all those dead ones, the reason they're concerning is that they can still sting you when you're de when they're dead. So if you step on them, not knowing what it is, then you can get stung on your foot too. Yeah. So, um, Jen, did you need a pen? Cool. I always need a pen. Did you want a pen? <gasps> oh, how did you get this cup? What cup? The C-SPAN cup. Oh, it's oh, my friend nice sent it to one. me. Who's that? Oh, so you can't big time me this time. I happen to know this is a package on the way for me too. So oh, Howard loves it. me too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is in my package though. That's a nice I cup. I assume it is. If, if, it, if it is in the most recent C-SPAN merch drop. 
Yeah. It is the best free subscription that I have, I, which is just being friends with Howard Mortman. And he just <laughs> periodically DMs me and says, uh, please give me your address again. And I just get free. You know what? I'm, I'm sick of this shit where you guys best. love Howard Mortman and he sends you free stuff. I'm going to become his enemy. I'm going to become this man's enemy and fight him and oppose him. It's going to be If I can't impossible. be loved by him, I will be hated by him. When we do our DC live show, I will kill you in front of him to show <laughs> my to show my support. I will I will be Howard's champion cuz yeah. he's too nice. He's too the much most of a lovely match. person in yeah. the universe. Okay. Yeah. Big fan of Howard Mortman. Communications director at C-SPAN, also host of uh the weekly. The weekly. The weekly. Yes. Bitch, if you Cute are not show. listening to it, it is like basically political nerd crack. Yeah, it's you just, so good. You just snort C-SPAN clips with the nicest man in the world who's just chopping up these lines. I'm sure he loves this analogy. Just chopping up, <laughs> chopping up these like succulent lines of like like political history yeah. uh, based on the weirdest stuff. Like like just ran. He did one that was all Boris Johnson's movie metaphors. When Boris Johnson got kicked out, yeah, awesome. Did one uh, uh, because they were celebrating. The reason why uh, uh, these were in the mail are because uh, C-SPAN's 45th anniversary uh, just came and went a week ago. Uh, so s- since 1979, we're in the first person to uh, speak during uh, C-SPAN. Little little trivia, anybody? Wait, dur- what do you mean during 79? it? Like the first person that they f- they filmed? They opened the uh, business of the House of Representatives in 1979, and uh, the first representative to speak uh, about C-SPAN. I don't know if he was the first. I'm going to guess the first James Trafficant about C-SPAN. Uh, no, uh, Representative Albert Gore Jr. Oh, oh look at that! Uh, and he said it was going to revolutionize. The, the house's business, the, the people's house, uh, which I think it I think definitely it did. did. He was right. But uh, they did an episode about all the other stuff that was talked about, which was just great to hear, like, you, what, you know what other things were being talked about the first day that C-SPAN was, uh, was broadcasting live. Yeah, Al Gore does show. not get enough credit for being boring, in my opinion. Like, like he, like, as we talk about, like, wouldn't it be great to have a boring... Like, like, have politicians be boring? He was, like, a super boring candidate. Was he, though? I don't think so. I th- he was a very boring speaker. He was huffy. <laughs> <laughs> That's one word for it. Yeah. And he kissed his wife too hard. That was weird. And yeah. then they got divorced. Yeah. Well, but, you know, yeah. like, 20 years later. Yeah. But can you imagine, like, single Al Gore? <laughs> Hello, I'm former Vice President I'm, Al I'm, Gore, and I'd like to get in your pants. <laughs> I'm on the prowl for Poon. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but he's famous, so it probably works. But that was the thing, is he got, like, for real, like, hip famous after Inconvenient Truth. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. he was, like, surrounded by, like, Hollywood people. He was this yeah. oracle. Uh, it's a good documentary. Okay, so was it? I think it was. It taught me. I didn't before that document documentary. I did not know about climate change. I, I think change that's or what pushed it. me over into being a Democrat back in college. Uh, was watching that documentary. Al- although um, I'll be curious to rewatch it and see how many of the, how many at least of the dates that he throws out. I I uh, heard a I heard a theory the other day that I don't I don't have the I don't have the timeline in front of me, so I don't know if this this measures up or not. But. Um, Let's say in the 1990s, uh, environmentalism was still kind of up for grabs. Certainly in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, it was up for grabs. Like, um, you know, you have the Clean Air Act and uh, things like that signed in by George H.W. Bush. So it's not determined that it's Democrat yet. And I heard a theory that that was kind of where environmentalism got politicized. Now, I don't think that's entirely true because um, uh, like Captain Planet was very well, but I guess it wasn't partisan. Uh, but like, but anyway, the theory was that that's basically where it became an amazing a, voice cast. A, 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 go, go, go to the Wikipedia of Captain Planet. Look at the voices on there. Uh, glittering. The, Star studded. The, 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 the theory is that, that like prior to an inconvenient truth that uh, it had not become a partisan issue yet. And that 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 then became, well, if, if I'm a Republican and Al Gore said it, I don't like it. I don't want it. I think, I think it, there's it, some it, truth it, 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 to that. I, it might have supercharged it, but I think it it was not a coincidence that Al Gore was the guy to do it. I think it was, uh, you know. And actually, Reagan tore the solar panels off of the White House roof, so it's it started before that. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I mean, like you could, so like, like Nixon um, signs into law the EPA um, and you have George H.W. Bush um, either reauthorize or authorize the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. So you have legislative okay, landmarks. You are, you are, you are confusing actual things that got done versus the political meta that right like, like yeah, in the same way that elections. conservatives are fiscally responsible until yes, you actually look exactly. at how they spend like yeah. but that that yeah. is the the aura around that them is the and idea right and democrats and, and, don't like and war things are broadly, until they have an opportunity to declare it yeah things are broadly probably you know like hue to some of the like you know stereotypes for a reason elements but uh, uh certainly is not you know, a, a universal thing that, mm. that all are one or, you know, the other, like, you know, who actually has a, a, a pretty muscular conservation record is Ron DeSantis mm. because a lot of Republicans, especially in Palm beach and in Republican areas are like big fishermen and have, uh, you know, these complaints about some of the, the treatment of the marshlands. And so like, he's actually signed in some pretty, strong protections for the Everglades and, and stuff like that. But that's See, because this, Florida, this is one of those weird, weird terms yeah. things too, where like conservatives don't say environmentalism, they say conservationism. And there's a lot of overlap between environmentalism mm -hmm. and conservationism. But, sure. but like, if I say conservationist and I say like outdoorsman hunter, it's Republican. Yes. But if I say green environmentalist, mother earth, eco, it's Democrat. Like the terms have become like, like in the same way that like, if I say social justice, which team am I referring to? I'm referring to blue team. Yes. If I say Patriot, more likely Personal red freedoms. Team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like they've become, they become tribal code words. Mm -hmm. Although I wonder if we're due for a shakeup on some of that. Probably we are in lots of other categories, right? Like I think we're. And, and, and I don't think that it's going to get better. I just think people are going to co-opt. No, for sure. Words. Cause that, cause as, as I like to point out fairly frequently, the, the, Republican and Democrat parties are not eternal religions that manifest with no. a through line over time. They are grocery carts of different items that change periodically. Yes. And, and right now we're seeing one of the really big shifts in our, our lifetime, at least from when we were kids, where the, the Democratic Party is becoming the managerial party. And the Republican Party is increasingly trying to cozy up to the blue collar working class, which is very much different but than meanwhile, in rhetoric, every, but not policy. But everybody's trying to hold the last bits of the coalition that they are morphing away from and that's yeah. where you get the never trumpers who are largely from this uh, uh you know more managerial class they're like yeah i don't like where any of this is going they've held their nose progressives who the party the democratic party is leaving are like i don't know what the hell is going on with you guys and so they are uh, a strained element of that coalition and you know we've seen this constantly like like it is coalitions are kind of like a lava lamp yeah like they're just sometimes they're more sometimes there's a big bubble that stays there for a while at the bottom but eventually it's going to start my, my friend bacha unger sargon who's um you what know is her? She? oh yeah she's she's one i love bacha she's yeah. she's a friend of mine i've interviewed her a couple i straight up i have a crush on her she's amazing i've i've had i've had drinks with her and her husband <laughs> so i say this in a very like friendly yes. way but like she's delightful i, I find her enchanting <laughs> uh and uh um, she's a capital M unreconstituted Marxist, capital M Marxist. And the last time I was talking to her, um, she was like, yeah, like what I want is immigration restriction and an end to free trade. And Trump's pretty good on those. So like as a Marxist who's like very much working class, like she very much likes Trump because Trump now I being the evil globalist elitist neoliberal liberal, neoliberal shill, I want free trade. I think free trade is good. The rising tide lifts all boats, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but but she looks at Trump and goes, no, this is great. Bringing he's bringing jobs back to America for the working class. He's he's making it harder for immigrants to come in and therefore keeping wages the same. So like you're seeing this weird reconstitution going on. Uh, we can cut this if you are not comfortable. But uh, there was a moment when we were talking on the beach about another friend of yours. Uh, uh, that I, that was very funny and i've had in my head but there's been no way to use it in content uh your friend ayla oh yeah uh uh are you familiar with ayla you were at heaton's birthday party no she wasn't you oh, were she sick. was not oh she oh you were sick you were at my birthday party i was at yeah. the jen, jen was ill or joe, joe had been ill and you joe were had been ill oh, oh yeah okay. this is during the fucking covid yeah. yeah. Okay. So you weren't there, but uh uh, uh ayla are you familiar with if i say ayla do you know uh, what she is famous for how would you describe uh, the 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 niche that Ayla has carved a out? Ayla is a popular data analyst slash sex worker who has become very famous on Twitter and OnlyFans. Yes. So an extremely okay. analytical mind, 
um, uh, very interesting chat, and also like part-time escort OnlyFans model. Sweet. Uh, mm-hmm. and she's not when, the only one of those that I would know, by the way, I have nothing against it. Yeah. Well, nobody's saying that. No, no. no. She, I invited she, her to my we, birthday. We, exactly. And she showed up. She went viral, uh, a, a few, uh, weeks ago because she had a, uh, birthday gangbang mm-hmm. for which she <laughs> a literal <laughs> birthday, gang a literal birthday gangbang for which she charted with meticulous, mm-hmm. meticulous results from everybody that applied, everybody that dropped off. She's got one of these data chart analysis. Yeah. Uh, who came, who didn't, who, who came, came and who exactly. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, she's, she's amazing. However, I will say when I read that email, I did get a little bit flustered because I was like, Hey, now I invited you to my birthday. <laughs> We had a sing-along birthday when I turned 40. I invited you to my birthday. I, I'm not saying I would have gone. Maybe I would have gone. I don't know. But, like, I would have liked to have the invitation to your gangbang birthday. I, I, you know, like, this is just basic etiquette. Ayla? I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. I'm Andrew Heaton. I'm Jen Briney. And we're not wrong on this edition of the program. We're going to talk a potpourri of topics resulting around RFK Jr. And the grand opening and grand closing of Ronna McDaniel's time as an NBC paid contributor. All that plus your emails. Let's go ahead and get right in to this Kennedy situation. Of course, the Kennedy family, one of America's most storied political dynasties, is experiencing internal strife as Bobby Kennedy Jr., a former Democrat, embarked on an independent presidential campaign causing concern among Democrats regarding his potential impact on President Biden's reelection chances. RFK Jr.'s candidacy has been notable for its reliance on the enduring Kennedy legacy, including a themed Super Bowl ad that very much aped the JFK ads of the 1960s. The strategy uh, has also included a a plan to go to Cesar Chavez Day, seeking to reconnect with the Latino vote reminiscent of JFK's Viva Kennedy campaign. But speaking of that Super Bowl ad, the woman who largely funded it, Nicole Shanahan, was named this week as Kennedy's VP pick. Ka-ching! The RFK Jr. uh, campaign, of course, has not been without its uh, detractors, including members of his own family. Four of his siblings publicly criticized his candidacy, distancing their father's legacy from RFK Jr.'s current political endeavors. And significant Kennedy figures have aligned themselves publicly with President Biden, including many of them at a St. Patrick's Day event only a week ago. Meanwhile, RFK Jr.'s campaign is alleging DNC inference to his ballot access, specifically after collecting the required signatures for access in the pivotal swing state of Nevada. DNC operatives challenged his application on the grounds that he did not list the name of his vice president. Two days later, he announced Nicole Shanahan as his vice president. We still don't know the resolution of that, if he's just going to be able to refill that out or if he's got to recollect all of those signatures. Heaton, VP, election interference, family drama, which RFK topic are we starting with? Uh, Well, I'm going to ask you a question, Justin. Um, When I saw uh, Shanahan uh, put out as the VP candidate, my first question was who? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then immediately saw that she is married to, uh, or was formerly married to one of the Google founders and has a fuck ton of money. And I went, well, that explains that. And so when they I, split, I, she it, challenged uh, the prenup. Am, am I am I missing Smart. anything here that he's he's using a VP that can bankroll the campaign because that's what it looks like. It in the most cynical way because he was looking at Aaron Rodgers, who's one of my all time favorite sportsmen. <laughs> True. No what sport Aaron. does Aaron Rodgers play? Football. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, he knows this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not baseball. I've been corrected. And there's only three sports. <laughs> okay. Uh, so <laughs> let's assume that that uh, uh, RFK is certainly as pure a heart as any politician. And he had a conversation with Nicole Shanahan and knew, oh, my God, this young woman uh, would be the youngest vice president. She is full of exciting ideas. She's bankrolled all these very child important of immigrants, documentaries. Good stuff. Uh, uh, and yes, Grew up absolutely. poor, good stuff. She, uh, uh, as a child of Oakland, will lead uh, America forward. And totally is like, oh, wait, she also has untold millions of dollars? Uh, uh, 
well, geez, I guess we'll have to deal with that too. The more cynical version is that, you know, there's probably a, a small coterie of people that are making the decision in this campaign as a mega donor, you're going to have a voice in that. And there was probably a lot of conversation of who's the VP going to be. And at some point she or somebody else said, you know, Nicole, you'd be great. I think you are the person that well, needs you, to go You know what there. it does show? It does show to me what I picked up when I met him here a couple of weeks ago, that he's actually running a campaign. That, that, oh, yeah. This is not a, I want to get a book deal campaign, no. which is a, t- a tried and true way. Uh, nor is it a hilarious Dave Barry esque running for president kind of thing. Um, nor nor is it the the ceremonial trot of the values I believe in that certain third parties do, knowing that it will not result in anything. Um, so I think he's actually trying to win. Uh, a couple of things that I'll that I'll point out that I, I get immediately aggravated with are um, one attempts to immediately block him from ballot access mm-hmm. because the party that champions democracy and has saved us from the evil clutches of Trump doesn't really want democracy when it gets competitive. Um, I, I would like to think that America can do. What are we? What the fuck are we doing? Uh, I'm trying Jen to is, find Jen a single fiddling. pen that fucking works. They're all works. new. They're all new. I got them all new for you. Well, thank you. I need them to work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it um, works. Carry good. on. Thank you. Um, I'd like to think that uh, you know when we look at like North Korea. We're China, and we're like, oh, God, or Russia. We're like one-party rule. That's horrible. We yeah. have two parties. You get to choose between uh, King Joffrey and Ramsey Bolton. Um, I think we can do better than that. And I, I, don't, I, I want the Democratic and the Republican Party, uh, which both do shit like this all the time. They're both awful. Uh, I, would, I would love for them to um, actually want competitive elections rather than competitive elections plus five for my team, which is, I think, what they really want deep down. Uh, the other thing I'll throw out is a, a lot of a lot of political hay has been made out of the Kennedy family the last few weeks where Biden invited all of them to the yes. White House, I think, for a pre for a pre Easter thing. Uh, and they, you know, all took pictures. Uh, uh, people are coming out saying, like, you know, it's, it's very telling that none of the Kennedys are endorsing RFK Jr. And I, I'm it, possible he's a psychopath and they've all picked up on that. I don't really know. But what I will say is, like, I think a lot of families have a cousin they don't get along with. And um, the last few years, I think a lot of families have really cleaved uh, based on politics. There's a lot of people that like kick somebody out of their family because they voted for Trump or vice versa. And so I'm, I'm not thrown off by that, that, that uh, members of the Kennedy family would potentially have more loyalty to the Democratic Party than their cousin. I don't know what the, the makeup is. I don't follow Kennedy uh, politics, but, but that, that doesn't immediately make me go, oh, well, he has to be a horrible guy because the rest of the family's not in favor of him. Yeah, I also question like, you know, there's a lot of people in the Kennedy family, like a lot of people. And so I'm curious how many of them really know RFK Jr. Also, like I have a very famous cousin that I don't talk about publicly because I've never met the man, but we are technically related. Um, And so when you look at the number of Kennedys that there are and, you know, RFK Jr. is married to Cheryl Hines, like they are Hollywood people on the other side of the country. Like I don't actually know how well they know each other. Um, and also, I'm like the royal family it gets along super well. I know the royal family families. gets along yes. super well, and the Kennedys are probably the closest thing to the royal family. I mean, in if I were to run, what for kind president, of Boston weirdos just ship the whole family off to Southern California anyway? Um, my <laughs> my family, <laughs> yeah. And like speaking of them, if I were to run for anything, there are people related to me that could come out of the woodwork and just be like that one. Like I have so many Trump lovers in my family, just like rabid Trump lovers that would definitely not support my candidacy so i just i don't really read that much into it like oh this family that's been basically like the kennedys and the democratic party there's three of them are ambassadors in the biden administration yes. like this is a family that is the democratic Car- caroline party. kennedy is a professional ambassador she she had uh, yeah. I, th- yes. I think she'd done charity work in new york like she'd done something with the philharmonic orchestra or something like that but she was made ambassador to japan because she's a kennedy and so she's royalty it, it, and then because she'd been ambassador to japan she was made ambassador to australia because she had ambassadorial experience and yeah. when you're a political appointee like that what that means is you get a feudal title in the united states for the rest of your life and you get to throw cool parties. I think the ginger is ambassador to uh, is Ireland. Yeah. He's, he's, he's Joe, special Joe Kennedy three. He's like special envoy, which means that they One already had an ambassador, but wanted to give him a job. Special, <laughs> like because he because he ate, I've his, been own, an envoy he ate his own shit trying to primary Ed Markey yeah. unsuccessfully. 
uh, oh, he's the one whose whose jaw drops like three inches lower than everybody else's, and he just I'm Joe. Ca-. Like yeah. he, he talks like a muppet. I mean, look <laughs> uh, uh, as as a student of the ruthless, brutal campaigns that JFK and RFK ran under the tutelage of the original Joe Kennedy. The the absolute slapdick nonsense that has come out of that family since then yeah. has like I, I say this without compunction as somebody who has studied that era. You are shaming your ancestors. They <laughs> they are all they, they should all appear as force ghosts and make the jerk off motion whenever <laughs> any of them do anything. Yeah, so I don't really care what the Kennedys say about RFK Jr. I'm watching his his candidacy. Did you see uh, Nicole Shanahan's speech? Yeah. And so what I did, I didn't come back from camping until this morning. And so I actually listened to a podcast. It was an hour and a half long recorded before she was announced as the VP, just an interview just to see who she is. Because my initial reaction when I heard this was I was pretty pissed about it as someone who's actually considering voting for the man, because it seemed to me just like some cynical ploy to just she's got the money. That's it. Now that I've heard more about her, um, as much as I don't love that she has no governing experience, what I've long said about RFK Jr. is one of the things I like most about him is as an environmental lawyer, he is someone who is very aware of corporate capture of our regulatory agencies. He's someone who is aware of the chemicals in our air and in our water and wants to do something about it. And that is something that I worry about all the time. I think our country is horribly underregulated when it comes to things that are environmental. I think the corporations are allowed to get away with literal murder with the way that they pollute in this country. And so listening to her talk and talk so much about the environment and being healthy. And I also know that she is an expert in AI. So having talked to you guys and like our, the concerns that we've expressed on this podcast, she's someone that when she talks about it, she talks like, like you, Justin, Like it's, it's, she is someone who is knowledgeable of it. Um, and she's talking about, we're going to be regulating this. And if we don't do it the right way, we could stifle innovation. But if we also don't do it the right way and we just let this thing go wild, like this, it's not accurate. We need to figure out how to train it to make it accurate. Like this is someone who understands this issue that I do think is going to be really important to have someone who is under the age of fucking 90 regulating in the next 10 years. Yeah. And so when I look at the job she would actually be doing as vice president, possible president, um, she would be the head of law enforcement. And so I would like someone who cares about environmental law and who understands corporate capture and who the other thing I like about her is that she spent she's, a lot of time talking about it in her in her debut uh, uh, speech. She, yeah, she talked a lot about environment and and uh, uh where we are being poisoned she, she uh, her big thing was chronic illness that we yeah. need to understand chronic illness and she believes that there is more of it about our environment uh and it is not a magical medical cure that we need to yeah. to understand these environments and there's problems. a lot to that like i um i just started using this lip balm it's got spf 20 in it and i like it i like the color i like the feel i like everything about it but then i looked at the chemicals that are in it. And I was like, Oh shit, I'm pretty sure both of these are poison. So I looked into it and like, I'm going to use the rest of them. It's not that bad, but it's not something I'm going to use regular regularly. And the fact that I don't trust our regulatory agencies to ban something when we know it's poison. Cause like roundup, we know that that's poison. We fucking know they are finding it so difficult to ban it in this country. And there's so many examples of, you know, the chemical industry and the fossil fuel industry and all these different industries that are allowed to keep doing things for a very long time um, because our regulatory agencies are captured. So the fact that she's even saying this as someone who'd be in charge of the executive branch, I like it. I like it a lot. And then when it comes to foreign policy, one of the things I learned in this um, podcast episode is that she's not only half Chinese, but when she was in college, she went and spent time in China. And so she understands China. She worked in Chinese patent offices and she understands, you know, international trade, but especially China and in a way where she's not like China all bad, because I think what I have been witnessing in the past few administrations is that we're just more and more adversarial to China. And I do think that we need to have some good faith in that relationship for the sake of the world. And so I do like the fact that she would be able to communicate with the Chinese as someone who is favorable to them as in her 
ancestry. Like her mother is a Chinese immigrant. So no. um, the good Chinese faith. Love because they're racist. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go back to ignoring Justin. <laughs> <laughs> but the more I got to know this woman, the more I was like, okay, I'm going to give her a chance. I'm going to see what happens here. Because the more I listened to her, the more I liked her and her priorities. And when I look at the actual job that she would be asked to do, I really want someone who cares about these things. Like I think the things that she was talking about are the things that I'm worried about for my own health and safety. I'm worried about clean water. I'm worried about clean air and the shit in my lipstick. And um, I want more governing in that direction. I think she would go there. So I uh, watched your whole debut speech and I uh, broke it down on the live stream. I uploaded just that all to YouTube. So if anybody wants to watch it uh, of me talking about it in real time, we can downsides. She's not a particularly dynamic speaker. She sounds more like a conference uh, a speaker than she does a political speaker. Uh, obviously this is her first time on the big stage. So uh, grade with a curve, but I, I don't know how much you're really able to, to get it markedly better in, in the fire. Like she's going to be in this I don't time. Know. Stand up. How long does it take you to get comfortable on stage? Uh, it depends on how often you do it. Let's say you're doing it a couple times a week, maybe three months to get your sea legs under you, six months to get decent. But also that includes bombing, which you yes. can hopefully which you, do. You just fucking eat shit at. Yeah. There's no way to do it. Learning learning stand up comedy is like learning guitar in front of people that are judging you as a person. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and also you're not your first forays into stand up are not really judged into your overall body of no, work. You're, nobody you're doing gives a bunch a shit. of fucking yeah. awful open mics at the the Chuckle Hut at eleven PM on a Thursday. So with that being said, uh, uh you know, grading on a curve, she's not a professional politician. Maybe she gets. A but, I mean, bit isn't that their whole thing, though? Is they're they're going to like they are the outsiders that are going to break up the duopoly yeah. and the capture yeah. government, but, but et cetera, et cetera. Like, yeah, that's a thing you say. There's also being able to whip up a crowd into a big frenzy, which you want to do, even if you are an outsider, right? Uh, she does have a colorful personal history. Married to Sergey Brin, allegedly had an affair with Elon Musk. Oh, people, I don't know that. people deny that, but. Trust yeah, me. I do wonder how much she's going to take on the corporatocracy, considering she's banging literal billionaires here and there. I mean, that being said, uh, uh, she that's already out there. It was reported yeah. by The Wall Street Journal. Uh, and yes, that will be brought up a lot by the DNC, which are spending a lot of time and money to make sure that RFK gets thrown into a black hole and never sees the light of day. You know he's an anti-vaxxer, right, Justin? You don't need to ever think about him again because he's an anti-vaxxer. That's all you need to know. Oh, my God. There yeah. you go. He's I'm an anti-vaxxer. So uh, are you an anti-science? That's it. You, so, dismiss him. Dismiss him. Don't think. Dismiss on him. the other side, I think she is somebody who is has a compelling story. I think that she has a lot of upside because of the colorful personal stuff. Anytime that people are talking about who she slept with, you are attracting attention to the campaign. And the more that you are talking about whether or not she's fit, the more people are just going to go to RFK's YouTube channel. And that's pretty much been the pipeline that has made him the candidate that he is right now. Now, who knows exactly how much his support right now, which is about 10 or 11% boils down to by the time that we get I'm to November, I would expect probably make a less prediction. than half. I, I'm okay. This time in 2016, Gary Johnson was polling at 10%. Yeah. Uh, enough so that the um, uh, the board that controls the presidential debates went for no uh, particular reason, uh, just for general quality control. We're now changing the standards to fifteen percent plus majority and at least twenty five, like some bullshit, right? That, yeah. they, they literally went fuck. This guy might got on stage. We do not want competitive democracy. I want to emphasize that the Republican Democratic parties don't want competitive democracy. They want a duopoly. Um, knocked it out. And you, you could watch, I think Gary Johnson peaked like 12 or 15% in polling. And then it, what happened is what happens to every third party candidate, which is the closer we get to the election, people freak out. They become very tribal. They get into lesser of two evils thinking and they retreat to the mothership, whatever it is. So yeah. At some point in this country, that's going to have to break. There's too many of us that are just sick and tired of the Democrats and the Republicans. At some point, that's going to have to break. I, the, so. I know the, it's been the, the pattern. The double, but... the double haters, or as a, a, a progressive campaign consultant, Annette uh, uh, Osario said on my show uh, this week, uh, the no-nos. <laughs> The, the, the double nose, those are going to be, they are the most coveted voting block for both major parties. They will sustain whatever comes to any of the third parties because those are the people that are the most likely to vote for one way or another. In my opinion, third 
parties do the best when you are voting for something. Mm -hmm. You cannot be about voting against something. And that's where the, the, that Gary Johnson ticket wound up getting a little wobbly was that they ultimately came down to like, Hey, we're, fuck, the, we're the sane alternative. Fuck Trump and Clinton, yeah. but with memes. Uh, yeah. and, and that was not, they didn't have a big tried and true libertarian thing that was going to be broadly popular. Uh, well, and, and John, then, Johnson was almost running as like a no labels character. Like, like yes. jo Johnson is a, and I, I like Gary Johnson, like both personally. And I, I, I voted for him. Like, I very much like that centri and then, and centrist got, libertarian yeah. milieu thing, but but he, but he wasn't like a hardcore plutonic capital L libertarian. He was sort of a sane 90s Republican running as but, an alternative. But also you need a thing. You need a thing yeah. that identifies you, right? And that's the Democrats desperately want that to be for RFK anti-vax because they want people to think, oh, he's the anti-vax. He's cookie. Running, right? What he wants it to be is the environment or whatever. But I think if... Or just like a hopeful campaign in general, which well, but, yeah, but it's got to have a thing. It's got to have a hood ornament, or else it's not going to work. Like that—that that is what the the history of third party candidates tells us. And if he's able to find it, then he has a shot at staying closer to ten percent. I like what they're doing with environment and health because I—I I mean, kind of what we started with the opener, like the idea that Republicans don't care about clean air and clean water and chemicals and their kids' food and and all this stuff. I think is just horseshit. So I like the idea of focusing on things that we can all agree on, which is that none of us want to drink poison. None of us want to breathe in toxins. Like this is stuff that I think a lot of people are concerned about regardless of their party and regardless of how it's framed. Um, so the idea that he's going for something that I think is low hanging fruit of just basic safety of Americans health. Um, I think it could be the thing. I think it could work. It's working on me. I got one more thing. That's an upside for Shanahan. Before she was an RFK mega donor, she was a Democratic mega donor. Yeah, Biden one, right? Biden and Marion Williamson and Marion Williamson and Buttigieg and yeah. So what she made which, which I find to, interesting that you, if you're giving money to Marion Williamson and Buttigieg and Biden, that that is a very widespread to me. Well, she only went to Biden what? after everything had shaken out. Okay. So she was a good soldier once everybody consolidated. Okay. She's like, okay, I'm going to cut my she, check. She wasn't the hedging her bets. This was after the. No. Yeah. Uh, she made reference during her speech of like, I was tired of the lies or whatever. The more she tells stories or goes on podcasts and says, anyway, I got so frustrated. I was on a Zoom call with Reed Hoffman and, and he said something so cynical and so gross. If you start poking those bears, if she starts naming names and telling stories from inside those halls, they will not have the, and I, by they, I mean the Democrats and those, those mega donors, they will not have the discipline to not lash back out at her. Mm. And if this becomes about that, then all you are doing is elevating your platform. So she, if she wants to really burn these bridges and it depends Name on names. how much she really wants to throw Molotov cocktails, she can make a real mess and they will burn call them her, girl. They will Do call it. her every name <laughs> in the book. It'll get racial. It'll get nativist. It'll get a uh, uh, slut shamey. Like it will get gross, but if she's willing to do it, she can make a gigantic mess which is going to put a ton of attention on that like it would campaign. be so fun. Like like yeah. Andrew Yang is not, and I really like Andrew Yang. But we, I know Justin and I have talked about this. Like we went to a, an Andrew Yang event together, and I'm I'm a fan of his. Uh, but what what happened to Yang exactly? Like you get the distinct impression that he was promised some shit, and that yes. that was yanked out from under him. Oh no, he was when when Biden was down and out, and Yang was super cool. Uh, Biden was talking about like, oh, my friend Andrew Yang, so smart, fourth industrial revolution. This guy's the future. Blah 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 blah, and. Yang was a good little soldier and he, and he endorsed Joe Biden immediately. And then he moved his family down to Georgia to make sure that Raphael Warnock was going to yeah. win. Like yeah. he was very much plugged in. Almost, almost like he was promised something like, like a secretary position or I don't, a really choice ambassador role or something. And then afterwards, and hey, then a good bunch job. of people who had been waiting in line for a really long time in the democratic machine said, Hey, great job, buddy. Here's your ticket. Go ahead and wait. Maybe in a couple decades, uh, you'll 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 get something. And that's when he left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, 
Anyway, just to mention the Gary Johnson campaign again, he was doing whatever he's going to do before his uh, uh, absolute coward of a low moral character vice president sold him out and endorsed Hillary Clinton, uh, therefore taking out the promise. Justin does not like Bill Weld. Low moral character. Low moral character. There's few things that are more cowardly than spitting in all of your volunteers and donors' faces. Yeah, that is awful. At the 11th hour. Anyway. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, friends. Patreon.com slash where not rock. Still like Bill Weldon. Mean. Of course you do. Yeah, I mean, of course I do. Why? I like Rockefeller Republicans. Yeah, but what about, is there any element? He, should, of... he shouldn't have done that. But okay. I like, the, but the, the, the weird, like, he's the one man in America that should be thrown into a volcano Low moral over the character. last 10 years, to me, is stretching it a just bit. Just whenever we talk about that campaign, just know I'm going to touch base on low yeah, moral I know, character I know. Bill Weldon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's still welcome to be a patron. Patreon.com slash where not wrong. <laughs> Maybe I'll think better of you, William, if you uh, head on over to patreon.com slash where not wrong and you become a patron. You're going to get a bonus episode each and every week, just like everybody else, unless I take it away at the 11th hour. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you to listen to the fifth column instead. Yeah. This week, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about Diddy. Where's Diddy? Diddy. Do we even know? No more parties in L.A. for Diddy. Uh, at least after the feds raided both his California and Florida mansions, head on over there. You were you were you were dialed in on this one. I mean, I, I saw a post, but I was just like, the list of things he's being accused of is so long, and I just I had to share, so I shared it with you. And then Andrew, you're so cute. You're like, is this Sean? Yeah, I was Diddy like, is this Combs? is this Coombs fellow? <laughs> Diddy Coombs? Is it a is is Diddy Diddy's like his moniker? But it's not his real name. His, his, his Christian name's not Diddy. No, it's Sean Combs. Sean Combs is his yeah. Christian name. Puff you Daddy, as, Puff we, Daddy yeah, as yeah. we originally knew him back in the day. So Puff Daddy's the same guy as Diddy? Yes. P. Diddy's Puff Daddy. P. Diddy is Puff Daddy. <laughs> because, P, because Puff Daddy takes too long to say, so we started saying P. Diddy? It was a rebrand. Yeah, we can't explain okay. this. A right. rebrand, okay. yeah. There's a lot of problems with him. Yeah. Prince did that. He changed his name he to did. a symbol. He did. Mm-hmm. He did. Uh, uh. He did. He said, I thought I told you that we won't stop. And apparently he meant it literally. Okay. Mm-hmm. And apparently he meant drugs and he meant sex and he meant all kinds of illegal things. A rock star mm-hmm. into drugs and sex. I, I don't like where this I'll is going. What, we're going to get into it. Cause I, yeah. I think, I think my, my, my take might surprise on Diddy. NBC news is reportedly severing ties with Rona McDaniel, the former Republican national Committee chairwoman mere days after hiring her as a paid contributor. The decision follows a significant backlash from both current and former NBC staff and on-air criticism from high-profile and MSNBC hosts such as Rachel Maddow, Joy Reid, and Nicole Wallace. Puck News revealed the network's plans to dismiss McDaniel, noting ongoing executive deliberations and McDaniel's search for legal representation. Despite the absence of an official announcement while we were writing this, it has now since been official. The statement regarding McDaniel's uh, departure uh, came down on Tuesday. McDaniel's hiring was controversial due to her close ties with Donald Trump and her involvement in disputing the 2020 election results, leading MSNBC President Rashida Jones to reassure staff that McDaniel would McDaniel would not be forced to appear on their programming. That was before, you know, she got fired. McDaniel's brief stint at NBC was marked by a single appearance on Meet the Press this Sunday which sparked widespread criticism within the network. Notably, Chuck Todd publicly comment, uh, condemned the decision on the same show right after the interview concluded, highlighting the discomfort among NBC ju- journalists due to previous experiences with the RNC. The controversy then extended to Morning Joe's co-hosts and M- MSNBC personalities who questioned the decision and its implication for the network's credibility. Uh, we have some some quotes here that we can go into, but we will start with Jen. Is this the right call or is intellectual purity so important to NBC that they can't even find room for a Romney? (laughs) I think this is just another example of how awful the corporate media has become. Um, Because as we're talking about, I mean, I'm no fan of Ronna Romney McDaniel. She was the chairwoman of the RNC during a time when the RNC has just gotten crazier and crazier. Um, It seems like there is no low that that party isn't happy with with hitting. But that said, this is the same network that hired Jen Psaki. <laughs> right <laughs> out, right out of the- Wait, hold on, but she's from the good team. 
Well, there you go. That's, that's exactly all you need to know. Right. She tells truths. Yeah, she took because she's on the good team. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jen Psaki, in case you're unfamiliar, I'm sure most of our audience is, but she was the literal spokesman for the Biden White House. And the then first got, press secretary. Yeah, the mm-hmm. first press secretary, and then got hired by MSNBC, and we're just supposed to pretend that she's an independent now and not a total arm of the party and the Biden administration. Like, okay, like let's suspend disbelief with that. Um, this is also a group of so-called journalists that had fuck all to say when Met- Mehdi Hassan was taken off of the air after October 7th. He's since voluntarily left the network, but they pulled him because he was talking too much about things that didn't please um, Israel. This is a network that has problematic people all the time. I think Michael Steele, isn't he a former RNC chairman who's a contributor on the... Yeah, but he's like, a never-Trumper. Yeah. Well, Therefore, so, he's, he's, he, has, he, has, he has sufficiently renounced yes. his former religion, and he yeah. has embraced the new religion. But that's the other thing with Ronna Romney McDaniel. This is why I was late today. I went down this rabbit hole. Because watching the January 6th committee... She was witness, and I went back and read the transcript, and what she was saying was, so her role in all this and why she was questioned is as the chair of the RNC, she had a phone call with Donald Trump and that lawyer John Eastman, both of whom have been indicted in this plan to get electors in seven states to certify on documents that Donald Trump won in these states, even though he hadn't. So it's basically fraud. And she said that she was brought- Or a legal theory. We'll find out. Okay. So it's fraud, but <laughs> Ronna Romney McDaniel, her role in this is that she was called by Trump and Eastman, and they said that we want to gather electors in these states in case the legal challenges that we are, are working through right now, and this was in December, we have these legal challenges. If they are successful, we want to have these electors on standby so that we could submit these documents as real which in that case, they might have been. It was all about the legal challenge. And she's like, okay. And the electors, it was apparently like the campaigns that gather the electors. And in these conversations, they were also talking about gathering electors for the states that Trump had won. And so her role, she just you know, said like, yeah, we were supporting the, the campaign, like getting the electors that they needed. But I was told under, and she said it over and over again, that these were only for if the legal cases went our way. Yeah. She was not brought in on this plan, and then she cooperated willingly with the January 6th committee. I remember Trump being quite pissed at her for this. So the idea that she is some rabid MAGA just doesn't even make sense to me, having checked out the facts of what she actually did with January 6th, which was not participate in the plot to submit those seven documents, at least not willingly. She didn't know what they were actually trying to do. The, the, the crew that did that could not even really be credibly called the Trump campaign. It was, it yeah, was, it was a, a collection of-, of apple dumpling gang, like hangers on that became elevated because they yes. were the only ones that would keep saying, yeah, no, I think you have a path here. Yeah. The people that were willing to do it. So even though she was contacted by Eastman and Trump, she was not in on the plan with them. She did not help them do it. She's not one of the people that is indicted in any of the states because she was a part of this, then she would have been indicted by Fonnie Willis in Georgia. I mean, that's a RICO case and she's not a part of it. So she is not one of the people who tried to deny the election, and yet all these people are accusing her of doing so. Would you like to read some of these quotes now, Justin? Sure. Nicole Wallace said, what we've said to election deniers is not just that they cannot do that on our airwaves, but they cannot do that as one of us, a badge-carrying employee of NBC News as paid contributors on our sacred airwaves. Joy Reid says, it's saying that we have to entertain the idea that the election was stolen on an equal level, that we entertain the idea that we should be a multiracial democracy. That is not fairness and balance. That is capitulating to an autocrat in advance by saying, yes, we will take your apparatchik and allow them to be elevated and platformed with us. Red Jen Psaki, again, <laughs> fresh out of the Biden White House, didn't even get a day between stepping from the administration in to the NBC ecosystem. This isn't about red versus blue. It's about truth versus lies. Service to the country versus service to one man committed to toppling our democratic system. That is the type of experience that Ronna McDaniel brings to the table. Yeah, and as I look at what she actually did, that just doesn't 
jive. Like she's not doing and on the meet the press interview that Chuck Todd immediately after trash trashed. Who by the way also came out of democratic politics. Yeah. It, he worked he worked for Tom Harkin's 92 campaign. He came out of democratic politics. It is not rare for no. uh, major media figures to come out of politics to talk about things because what you really want, these people are not journalists, they are analysts. And what the best thing you can hope from an analyst is experience. Oh, I remember this was like this back then. This reminds me of this, this, this. You're telling a story. It's the reason why ex-athletes are on ESPN. So they can say, I remember when we were down 3-1. This is what we said to the locker room. Exactly. And so that guy had a big yeah. fit about Ronna Romney McDaniel being on this Meet the Press interview. And in the interview, they straight up asked her, did Joe, Joe Biden win the election? She said, yes, absolutely. He won the election. But I think we have to acknowledge that in 2020, there were problems. That's what she said. Which is fucking true, because in 2020, <laughs> we had rules being changed all over the country. Now, I think a lot of them were necessary. Vote by mail is necessary in a pandemic in the first year when things were crazy real and scary and people were dying all over the place. But that does not change the fact that things were weird in 2020, that rules were changed in 2020, that election machines were used, and in six states at least, there is no paper backup required. We have problems with our elections, which are real, and I do think need to be discussed, even if we're talking about them happening in 2020. So she didn't say anything that makes me think that she's an election denier, and she didn't do anything that makes me think she's an election denier. She even criticized January 6th. She yeah. said the thing. She was like, I don't think violence should ever be used anywhere. I, uh, she disagreed with Trump in saying that he would pardon January 6th people if he became president of the United States. So she did the beginnings of the sacrament of re renouncing her former sinful ways, but it just was not enough. She was not pure enough for the cultural revolution that exists on the Slack channels of NBC. It sounds to me like these people were personally bitter about those years that she was the RNC chairman. Like she felt, they felt that she was like personally attacking them, which I'm sure the RNC did, um, because this is a network that is clearly speaking on behalf of the opposition to them, to the Democratic Party. I mean, yes. they couldn't be any clearer about it. So if they're going to be an opposition network, to then hold it against someone who behaved as if they are the opposition, it just it makes me dismiss the entire network, their credibility, their idea of being journalists. I just think. I mean, they're not. Television they're not. journalists are, are uh, uh, news flavored actors. Uh, Heaton. So having, having worked in uh, cable television with a number of news flavored actors, uh, I, I will bring up uh, one thing. I don't know if it's pertinent to this situation, but it could be. It's just something that I'll, I'll float out so listeners know that it's there. A lot of the time, networks get a contributor not in order to put them on TV, but to keep other channels from doing it. Roger Ailes was fairly notorious for this. Roger mm -hmm. Ailes would go, oh, like, uh, he didn't get Chelsea Clinton. But so Chelsea Clinton was a contributor uh, at I, NBC? NBC. NBC. They paid her. Because I think, she was qualified. They, they, they paid her $200,000. <laughs> she did exactly two things and then went away. But the, the deal, they were paying to have her name on letterhead if they wanted it. And more, more specific, maybe to curry favor with Hillary Clinton. Oh, but I don't know. Very, maybe. very <laughs> specifically so that nobody else can have her. That was it. Yeah. Like that, that happens a lot. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's some something in the contract here that Ronna McDaniel cannot do any other media. There's going and to be a big legal question of exactly yeah. how she's going to get paid her $600,000 and whether yeah. or not it's going to include her not working. Cause it, it wouldn't, it, I suspect that this is a, a kind of illiberal petulance that's happening at NBC on behalf of the anchors that resulted in a revolt, but it would not surprise me if what went on behind the scenes was somebody went, um, let's pay her off. Uh, not have her work for anybody else and then claim uh, moral righteousness over her and decide that we, we couldn't do it. I, I could see some sort of calculus like that happening. Now, that being said, given the um, the vitriol that we see from Lawrence O'Donnell and, and Joy Reid and Nicole Wallace et al., uh, a, a couple of things. I, I think the whole platforming thing is bullshit. Like, like, it, like your job as a journalist is to talk to people. Like, like um, this is something that... Um, uh, people get flack for all the time. It's about to get ramped up in this election where, um, you know, Trump's going to go on Rogan or something. And there'll be a whole outcry when that happens of how dare you give this guy a platform. Well, I would like to hear what like like when, when Carlson, uh, Tucker Carson, Carlson, 
uh, interviewed uh, Putin, I would like to know. Like, I, th- this is information that I would like available to me, and I'm not such a stupid dipshit that I'm incapable of filtering this information. Yeah. And I think if, if we want to have a democracy where everybody makes decisions and we all vote, we kind of have to trust people to not be completely fucking stupid <laughs> and be able to encounter ideas without being infected with Star Trek-style brain amoebas that take over their mind. I mean, it's Ronna McDaniel. Like, that's the thing that blew my mind. I thought when she got, when, when the news broke, I'm like, this is a really good hire for NBC. Because that's it's, what it's I gonna, thought. It, she's, she's not going to flame. This isn't Steve Bannon. This isn't no. Seb Gorka. This isn't Vivek Ramaswamy, right? It's not somebody who's just going to blow torch and call Chuck Todd a pedophile on, <laughs> on air, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this is somebody who's going to play by the rules. She's from a political family. She knows how far she should go, how far she shouldn't go. She's going... I've heard interviews with her on conservative media where she was very critical of the candidates that were selected in 2022. She was very yeah. upfront about saying, hey, look, my job was to run the paperwork. My job is to support the candidates. I don't do get out the vote. I don't do uh, X, Y, or Z. Well, I think she does do get out the vote, but uh, she doesn't run the candidates' campaigns. Uh, And she was very critical about that. That's good stuff on air. And by the way, when was it bad on television for people to argue? Like, granted, it doesn't all have to be super everybody's steam's coming out of everybody's ears, but a spirited debate is good well, television. Also, you, like, like, so one of the, I, I do a, a Patreon survey um, every year on the political orphanage to hear what patrons want. And like one of the criticisms I got that I thought was very well met that is now stuck in my mind and I hope to address at some point on the political orphanage is somebody went, hey, um, you really only bring on conservatives that agree with you about free market stuff. You don't bring on conservatives that actually disagree with you on stuff. Yeah. Like you're, you're selecting uh, the, the conservatives you already largely agree with. I would like you to actually bring on conservatives that disagree with you on social issues or immigration or things like that. And I was like, that was a well-met criticism because it was like, you know what, like that is, that is a, a part of the political spectrum that I am not engaging with, but I'd like to. And I think that that would be providing a service. Uh, of going, hey, there's a bunch of people that think this way. The, the bad news is there are a bunch of people in the country that think the election was stolen. I'm not one of them. I think it's absurd, and it, it, it atrophied the, the legitimacy of American institutions. But there's a lot of people there. But what are you going to do, valuable? just lock them all out? Wouldn't it be valuable to hear yeah. the RNC chairman, who was the chairman during 2020, say, no, it didn't happen, and now we have no place for well, this woman to speak? And going into 2024... As the former RNC chairman who was there during Trump, she has valuable insights. She does that she could yeah. have shared. And, and hold on. Let's let's uh, apologies to Marco Rubio. Let's dispense with this fiction that the idea of challenging an election is immediate dismissal for being on NBC. Because I certainly I heard know. a lot about how George Bush was an illegitimate president throughout 2000. I heard a lot about Diebold machines after 2004. Guess what? Society held together. It wasn't the end of the world. And I'm not here to say that those were all the same things. They were all different things. Now, they might all have a common thread, as Jen pointed out, of an eroding faith in uh, elections because we continue to hide them behind more and more opaque uh, uh, various different uh, things. And, and COVID very much exacerbated that because we had a lot of changes that were made without the state houses. But that being said, this is not a reason why you banned Terry McAuliffe from NBC. Terry McAuliffe was a paid... A, a, a paid opinion maker on NBC after he came out of the Clinton White House where he was talking about how George Bush was illegitimate and 2000 was illegitimately handled. This was mainstream thought. Mm-hmm. Again, but Russiagate! Two yes. fucking years! Yes. That, was the, that was the good team, though. You have, to, you have to remember, there's a permanent good team and bad team, and they understand they're the bad team. They know they're the bad team. I, I just hope this sticks to NBC. I, I, I honestly think that it was, number one, absolutely cowardly by their leadership to not look at each and every one of these people, Lawrence O'Donnell, Jen Psaki, Joy Reid, Nicole Wallace, and say, hey, understood. We can keep this in-house. You get one day to sound off and say whatever you want on your show, and then we're done with it. And if you have a problem with that, you can Olbermann your ass right out the door. Yeah. You can, you can go. You can start your Substack tomorrow if you want to be there. We'll have Ben Collins' misinformation report on at 8 o'clock next week if you want to be. There's plenty of people in line that would love Taylor Lorenz tonight will be will be on MSNBC and guess what the audience will eat them up just the way they're eating you up because you're not saying anything different you say the same shit every night and have the same people on that nod solemnly at what you have to say and and I am more offended on it in the fact that it's boring and intellectually stupid it is gruel than I am 
in any way uh, uh, upset that uh, of what they say. They're a, a television network. Now, granted, I don't think that you could see where they've gone in the ratings and say things are going great. Mm-hmm. I think maybe throwing a little bit of a chainsaw in the hot tub would be exciting <laughs> if everybody got mad and then all of a sudden they all had to do an interview with Ronda McDaniel over the next week. That might dare I say, be interesting television. But they yeah. don't seem interested in Well, that. let's put our asshole partisan hats on for a second, too. So we're sitting in NBC. We obviously want Biden to win. To have a woman who had you bothered to do your job and read the 59-page, very easy-to-read um, testimony that she gave to the January 6th committee, had you bothered to do that before speaking out against the woman, you might realize that she's down to play ball. <laughs> she's probably yes. not a Trump fan, and she could have really helped to be that token conservative who's like, listen, I was the chair of the RNC, but this is unacceptable because this is bad for our demise. She could have been that person for you. She's already she done that. She wanted to be it. Watch that, watch that Meet the Press yeah. interview. She was willing. She was ready. So it's just like, it's stupid politically. Trump, Trump, it's stupid. Trump pointed it out, too. He, it was on Trump. Oh, he was I on know. True Social, and he's like, uh, uh, Boy, it really sucks. She went on NBC. She said the thing that she was supposed to say, and she still got fired. Yeah. Uh, now she's in Never Never Land, it which proves, is not a good place to be. It literal proves quote. everything that anyone has ever said about NBC and MSNBC as them being partisan and awful. It proves it all true. Uh, I want to do a side side panel for a second, just on like the, the idea that we cannot countenance people that share a contrary worldview is, is a deeply illiberal way of looking at the world. Like I, I saw some quote the other day, and this was coming from conservatives. I don't remember who it was. It was probably somebody at the Daily Wire that was talking about how like, if you think transgender is a real thing, um, like you, you fundamentally disagree on reality and how can we even have a conversation with you? And my, my first thought was, you know, like Muslims think that Muhammad rode a horse to the moon and Christians think that uh, God was born from a virgin and that uh, he died and came back. Like, I'm fully God's capable. God's son. God's son. God, um, I'm fully capable of having conversations with people that have a very different worldview than me. I'm fully fucking capable of it. By the way, most people are. Most people listening to the show are completely capable of being an atheist talking to a Christian or vice versa on very many f- fundamental cosmos issues. And so when we start getting into this, like, well, like th- you're, you're believing in a warped reality about the election, so I cannot have a conversation with you. Like that, that to me is something that's antithetical to pluralism and the idea of being able to actually have constructive dialogue with people whom you do disagree fundamentally. But the idea that Ronna Romney McDaniel is that is also incorrect. Like <laughs> she's not really that. Funny. They couldn't <laughs> stomach a Romney. Yeah. But by the way, you keep saying that. How is she, how is she related to Romney? Is this his wife? His niece. This niece. Is his niece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When she got the RNC job, Trump said drop the Romney. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. She, she just became Ronna McDaniel. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, she was professionally Ronna Romney McDaniel. But I think for that's years. the most that she's bent to Trump. As far as I know, like she was not well, a MAGA. It's, it's a, I mean, number one, the, the, that, that, that position hated Trump back yes. before he got. But she, she was, she was the person that got put in. She was Trump's pick to to run the RNC. The thing, the reality of running a, a, a national party is that you're basically a janitor and a referee. Like there's there's not a lot yeah. of what you are doing that is really substantive. The thing that wound up getting her kicked out was reporting that there was a lot of sloppy financial stuff. So it's like, if you really wanted to attack her, you could be like, hey, by the way, why did you spend more on fruit than get out to, get, get out the vote uh, uh, text banks? Like, that was some of the stuff that came out about her uh, tenure there. Other than that, Jen, I'm totally on your side. She would have been an invaluable person to find out how the RNC is running. If you wanted to talk about how wild, like, whoever gets her, and who knows now what, position she's going to take or she'll just do a podcast or something like that but the stories that she could tell yeah. of i got called at two o'clock in the morning and this is what was said would be really interesting and she is a compelling person she's re- she's a really good on camera the story that she could have told about january 6th if they're gonna run on what happened in the run-up to january 6th she was an insider she was an insider. She's already told the story. The part of the story that she's told, I don't feel like is well known based on the fact that these fucking wannabe journalists don't seem to know what her testimony was. She has a lot of insight into what happened in those critical two months that NBC just threw Here's out the, the door. Other, the other reality about it, it was because she was getting paid a lot. 
How like, much? How much? They, they, Three hundred thousand a year, uh-huh. and they That's had just gone much. through a round of firings, and so there was a lot of the off the record quotes. This was like the the the, sa- uh, the salaries. Very wildly. Well, I think Rachel's television. getting three mil or something to do one day a week. But she's she is a linchpin yeah. for them. But you'll you'll also have the person that's got like a daily show that's making like maybe two hundred thousand a year. Like it like um it, like again, they're all it's not like there's in cable television like ah, this job we pay X amount. Like you're a sergeant now. Yeah. Like it's they, they all negotiate, it's all very, very different. Like contributors will like want to be contributors will like stand around waiting to fuck somebody just i will fuck you please make me a contributor yeah well, and they'll she, use them for free for years before they ever yeah. give up anything she's the chair of the rnc going into the belly of the beast like you have to pay and her well to do that she took a huge personal risk she, to she's work there willing to do the job in, yeah. in professional wrestling they call the wrestlers that are there to lose to bigger stars jobbers she was there to be a jobber because mm-hmm. she was going to go on all of these shows. And guess what the social clips that would have been out on, on Facebook and YouTube would have said? It wouldn't have been, Ronna McDaniel makes a great point. It would be, Rachel Maddow destroys, destroys all cats, destroys Ronna McDaniel yeah. on, on The Big Lie. Yeah. That's, she was willing to do it. She was willing to get, to get drug across the street yeah. so you could benefit. And, and they couldn't handle that. But that's the reason why. The reason why she got paid a lot and they just gone through a bunch of layoffs. As you might imagine, the DC press, this is all they wanted to talk about for the last 72 hours. And there were a lot of anonymous quotes like that of like, well, you fired all these other people, but you found $300,000 a year for Rana. Interesting. So a lot of petty jealousy. Mm. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com. Uh, Rachel Maddow. Bad decisions will inevitably happen. Mistakes will be made. But part of our resilience as a democracy is going to be us recognizing when decisions are bad ones. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com. Give me the green light. Right. Jen said that she's never seen so many cars run red lights in any place that she's ever lived other than Austin. Well, she hasn't been to Riverside, California. I bitch about it on a daily basis at least 20 times per day. Oh, honey. <sighs> I'm from Orange County. I don't spend time in the 909. So you're right. I've never been to Riverside. <laughs> I'm from. I've been uh, there. I didn't notice um, any of that, but I have no cause to discount you. I grew up just south of Logan County, Oklahoma. And we, when we moved out to where my parents currently live, there weren't stop signs yet. Uh, so you just had to not hit other cars. And at night, the old dudes would just turn their lights off at intersections. The theory being. Uh, that if you turned your lights off and you saw other headlights coming, you would know a car's coming. Uh, so you didn't need to slow down. You just turned your lights off. And that works real well until some other old guy is yeah. doing the exact same thing. Yeah. So we got, we got stop signs, though. Oklahoma's doing great. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Saving Private Gerbs writes, I'm having a blast picturing greatest generation Justin Robert Young storming the where the water hits the lands of Normandy. <laughs> The smartest man in Portland writes, I'm a lifelong resident of Portland, Oregon. When, I, when we go to the Pacific Ocean, we are going to the coast, not the beach. The water is cold, and so is the climate. It could be 100 degrees in Portland, but it would still be 75 degrees uh, 60 minutes away on the seaside. My first time in Southern California, I imagine my disappointment when I found out that the Pacific Ocean is still frigid, even when the air temperature is hotter than Satan's balls. Contrast that with my first time visiting the Atlantic Ocean in South Carolina. The air was in the 90s and the water was in the 70s. It was perfect. Yeah, so Cal water is not warm. Mm-hmm. Cold water is an abomination to God. <laughs> uh, speaking of EVs, got a lot of EV. Emails. Yay! Voice of the Voiceless writes, Fellow non-drivers, I call upon you to help me by flooding (laughs) Jerry's inbox. This bully will hear us. Get him! Very interesting that literally just advocating for what is by far the most popular transportation mode in America is me being a bully. And not me just stating the obvious. We don't have other alternatives. Oh, it's really popular because it's the only thing. Okay, like be proud of that. And who's the bully? Is the, uh, is the White House hating Tesla's, uh, Tesla good, right? The only reason why we're talking about electric cars right now is because of Tesla. They have the largest market share, and recently just about every major car company agreed to adopt their charging plug standard. And the Biden administration hates them. Wouldn't it be more beneficial for the administration to give Tesla a couple billion to build more superchargers around the country? Their supercharger infrastructure is by far the most advanced and reliable. And as I mentioned, all the other companies are now switching to using it. I'm not sure that that's 
true. Um, cause the standard or their tech. So the tech, because I do know that they're trying to standardize the Charging car chargers. Plugs. I was told this by the secretary of energy. Um, but I don't know that they picked the Tesla ones because so few of us are able to use them right now. You can only use them if you have a Tesla or there is this thing you can buy that switches it. But even if I bought that plug on, like I still can't use it in my car. So there is a, like the J, I think it's J1772, something like that is the charger that oh I God. can we use. We got so many technical emails that would just yeah. be absolute brain poison if I read them verbatim. But well, trust is, me, we had a lot of people that were writing in about charging standards. And you know what? Cars. I'm really not surprised by that because it, after I got home, I realized that it was a big omission that we didn't talk about it because it is very frustrating that even when I find chargers, most of the time, I can't use them. It has to be a very specific kind. So I can't use any of the Tesla ones when you see I, those. I thought, I, that they'd consult, I thought that no? Tesla had made some deal with the other ones where they were going to have the same universal They are. Plug. The only no. problem is cars so are older not ones. A, it's like a standard that update all the Type USB-B yeah. or whatever. There's not okay. standard chargers. There's not standard on the car side. Like So it's a, it's a wild system out there. So like there's some fast chargers that are very close to my apartment. I can't use them. Now, my car is a 19, or not a 19. 1998, I'd be damned. Yeah, it's a 2018, so I know that my situation, I'm, I'm driving an older car. But that is a problem, that every car has a different charger. So when you say, when you see charging infrastructure, you might think that there's more than there really is. Because I, as far as I know, Tesla might be the only car that can use almost I, all I, of them. I am pretty sure. I did not double check this because I assumed it was right based on other stories that I'd read because... There is a program right now, I think, for Toyota that you can get one of those adapters for free for the next year because going forward, they are going to standardize them. And I do think that Tesla did win the war okay. of standards. Uh, but do we have Which anything to say about, about, about the Biden administration being uh, adversarial? Uh, well, I, let me say this. Like. I don't want them to be adversarial with Tesla. I was unaware of that, but I'm I'm, I'm not nearly yeah, so plugged in as everybody that that's else fact is. Either. Uh, it, it is. You, it is. It, Tesla's not a union shop, and uh, uh, the union uh, Joe is a hardcore, especially right. auto well, union. Well, so guy. so okay. then then two thoughts. Um, one, I, I don't want the government being pro corporate or pro pro union. I want the government being a referee. I want them being neutral and enforcing laws. I don't want the government picking winners and losers, which is why. Uh, in addition to the fact that I wouldn't want it to be adversarial, I also wouldn't want to do what the listener pragmatically suggests, which is just give a couple billion dollars to Tesla. Uh, I think the government is not structurally suited to picking winners and losers very well. The market's going to be better for that. What the government could do in this instance that would help is just get its shit together. We talked about some of the problems that are, are being uh, uh, propagated through the uh, infrastructure spending in the last episode of... No, the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act. Thank you. Yes. Of, uh, Which um, is the environmental trying bill, but to, is not the infrastructure Trying bill. to proliferate solar panels by simultaneously having made an, uh, made in America requirements and things like that. Like, get rid of the speed bumps before we even get into picking winners and losers is my position. Well, I think part of getting its shit together is the government has to pick a charger. Like, they had to pick one. So this is a symptom. Like, if this is actually what's happening... This is a symptom of the government getting its shit together because it has been Wild West. Every company has picked their own charger. There's different networks. Like, that had to be standardized. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think that the, the sockets we use now were ever government mandated. I think the, that just kind of consolidated around one. I'm telling you as an EV driver, this is a problem that had to be solved. Had to be solved because even A standard when, charger. Yeah, yeah. Like, the fact that you... That it's, like if you bought a Tesla for a while, you could only go to a Tesla charging network and I could not go to a Tesla charging network. I know that mine works with Blink and ChargePoint, but there's an EVgo. Mine doesn't work with EVgo. The superchargers, mine doesn't work with superchargers. Like this is not something that if you're going to build out a national network as the Inflation Reduction Act funds, you can't build it out like this. You had to pick one standard. And so I think this is a symptom of them getting their shit together. This is an important step. The fact that they picked Tesla, well, Tesla was ahead of the game. They were well, the no, first no, they, ones. They, they to... did not pick Tesla. No, this he guy is... said that he did. No, he is saying, wouldn't it be better if. Uh, oh. Uh, well, then if, this if, would if be if an they, example no, of what so I'm talking about. I don't he said, think he said, it he, said, he said two things that, yes, the Tesla chargers, as an agreement amongst the private companies, will be the new standard going forward, and there are programs either from the company or I don't know if it's funded through the Inflation Reduction Act to give adapters to people that uh, uh, would be able to use yeah, the Tesla If that's what now. they picked. But 
uh, he is saying, wouldn't it be better if the money that let's say went out during the Inflation Reduction Act instead just went to Tesla so they could just build a bunch of more chargers because those are I mean, it very popular. Sounds to me that, like that a very big corporate standard. handout. Like you're just going, hey, Tesla, we're giving you money. Or yes. is it contracting for a job that needs to be done? Because whether you're handing out the money to Tesla or to 15 different companies, like at the end of the day, unless you have government workers putting these in, you're still contracting out well, the work. Well, I'd say contracting is a little different in that like when, when Boeing builds – jets for the American Air Force, the American people do own the jets when they're purchased. They're, we're not just giving money to Boeing going, here, you're doing fun stuff. I mean, or, or when we are, we shouldn't, right? Like if, if, if we were saying like, Tesla, we will pay you to build um, uh, charging stations at, at post offices or something like that, that would be contracting. Um, but okay. like where we're, we're just giving them money and saying like, we would rather you have the money than us. Like when we build stadiums, for example, that, that to me is different. Like if, you, if you're having a company build a stadium, but the, the municipality owns the stadium, that's contracting. If you're just giving a handout where you go, we would like that, that company what, to keep the what money. What makes you think that it would be just like a handout that they would It depends then... on how they do it. I mean, this, 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 this is a hypothetical. Yeah, we, it, we, it, we, okay. We're debating yeah, this is This is very yeah. like, I, I don't know how this would actually shake out. But my, my concern is I am very reticent to give corporations handouts. I am very reticent for the government to just give money to corporations. I, I would rather there be a strong firewall um, there are going to obviously we're going to have to do contract work like with roads and things like that. There's not a national road service. They have to hire contractors. But the road is then owned by the people. It's owned by yeah. the, the, yeah. the government. Right. So would you be OK with Tesla or some other company getting the contract to build the chargers and then the United States government owns them? Potentially. Operates them. I mean, it, yes. it, it depends on how you did it again. Like yeah. um, that's my preferred model, too. I don't want to give a bunch of money to Tesla because I don't trust I don't trust Tesla or any private company to not price gouge us because we need to refill our cars. Like, I would rather have it controlled by government, for sure. So I actually think we're saying the same thing. Could be. Yeah. yeah. Charged Up writes, I work for a very early stage startup, which makes batteries that charge for ten that charge in 10 minutes. I was oh. listening to you guys bemoaning the inconvenience of charging while in a dry room assembling test cells of a technology that will hopefully one day fix the EV charging time issue. It made me feel very good about my job during a very boring task. Thank you. I love hearing that. That's the best news ever. Thank you for letting us know that that's on the horizon. No True EV writes, Jen said to fill up 50 miles, it's two hours. But that's only because you have a PHEV, which probably doesn't support DC fast charging. It does not. Most typical EVs can get 80 miles of highway range in uh, more than a 15-minute charge. Again, this email was like 17 pages. Uh, uh, also, <laughs> charging to 100 will take more time than it's worth. If you're not charging overnight or all day, it's recommended to charge to 80. You'll get the most out of your time. Diminishing returns are a powerful concept. I wasn't in my 30s till I learned what diminishing returns are, but you see them everywhere. They're really helpful economically and in terms of engineering. Mm -hmm. Our listeners can understand it week by week here listening to the show. <laughs> <laughs> scoot, 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 writes... We all know the real victim of the decline of electric-based transportation, scooters. The absolute best way to zip around European cities, IMO, Paris, Berlin, Florence. My favorite memories are tooling around on a scooter with my family. You know, the, the real loss is Segways. Segways were a beautiful machine. I am very <laughs> sad. You were a Segway nerd. tour guide. I was a Segway tour guide, and I don't, I don't think I looked like a dork. I think I looked like Caesar on a robot. Did you wear a helmet? Yeah, of course I wore a helmet. So that's one of the problems with the electric scooters. Um, one of my family members is a nurse. And once those scooters, <laughs> do you guys, Justin, you live there. There was, I don't know, four months that scooters just took over San Francisco. Oh, God. Yeah. It was beautiful. A terrible. beautiful, a beautiful time. Oh, my God. There were oh. people crashing into pedestrians. Ma, la Dolce and... Vita. Ma. <laughs> it was just chaos. absolute anarcho capitalist <laughs> heaven. Just nothing but e waste littering the streets. But you could get home two seconds, chuck that shit in yeah. a bush, and yep. then. I'm, I, I, it was pure chaos. When I, when I went out to visit uh, Justin in Oakland, we would, we would go scooter riding, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but, but I am a little bit more, uh, as I've approached 40, I'm aware that I am mortal. And I'm aware that my injuries heal slower. And I've also heard some real gnarly stories from nurses and doctors of yeah. like, like some guy in his fifties will like puncture a lung because he falls over the handlebars. Well, and that's a curb why I was and... bringing it up is that, um, my, she's, my stepsister sort of, I don't know, but she's, she's a nurse. Little kid and, um, yeah, well, my family's complicated, but she, I love her dearly and she's a nurse and it's in the Bay area. And when those scooters were everywhere, the number of head injuries that they were yeah. dealing with just skyrocketed. And, um, and so the fact that we are using the scooters, but not 
having the helmets be a part of that. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the scooters. I don't think they're the way forward in transportation. That said, if we did have separated bike lanes for all of this electronic shit, including the scooters, you would have fewer injuries because people had to brake suddenly because a car is taking a right or something. Like, if you could separate those from the cars... You mean, at like, the scooter very lanes? Uh, uh, scooter are, are, lanes, bike lanes. Because scooter lanes and bike lanes... Same lanes. So yeah. they serve the same purpose. But if you had that separated from the cars, I think that at least would make it I'd feel a lot less better. Dangerous. It would also keep the scooters off the sidewalks, which I, yeah, are, are I hate them on the sidewalks for, yeah. for uh, walking people. And my dog. Yeah. Our friend uh, Darren uh, got hit while he was on a scooter. Really? Really fucked up his collarbone. Yeah. Who was oh this? my God, I didn't know that. Did I missed this chapter. Area. Yeah, it was. Late, late stage. This, this is before I, I joined the, the Justin Robert Young sitcom as the wacky neighbor character. Uh, I don't know where in the season. I don't know where in the box set this was. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, no, he, he really he got he got screwed up bad. Oh Hit by a car while on a scooter? car. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how much I, it wound up. I'll say this. But yeah, we don't yeah, have to say it, it, strong it, 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 wound, it, wound, it wound up ending up in court because the car was very much at fault. And uh, uh, yeah. So mm. that was the thing. I'm glad he's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Ask him. Ask him to, to show him. Uh, show you his collarbone. It's, it's I will. fucked up. Yeah. Just make them last longer. Right. I wish that they just make better cars. And by that I mean the car part of cars, not the add-ons. Seem like most academics gloss over or ignore that the majority of pollution and power consumption of personal vehicles comes from the beginning of their life cycle and the end takes a lot uh, to make them EVs in particular, and they often consume or pollute more in the last 10% of their lifespan than the first 90% combined. So isn't the simplest, cheapest solution that would help the most ecologically, financially, and socially with the least amount of uh, public inconvenience is to just make cars that last longer. I think so. Um, were you there? So when we were camping, there was this kid that rolled up in a pickup truck and it was just like an old, I, it was either a Toyota or something like that, but you know, like the old workhorse Toyota pickup cut pickup trucks that weren't huge, but like got the job done. Um, he rolled up in one of those and all of us were like, that's a great truck. And my brother-in-law drives the same truck and he gets offers for it all the time because those things will run for 30 die. years. Yeah. They don't die. They'll have 500,000 miles on them. They're fine. And, um, and this kid was saying like his car was in the shop. And so he got this thing and he was excited about like, the old cars that were built to last, people are hungry for those instead of this, you know, forced obsolescence so that we keep buying more shit. Mm. I think this is a really good point. I'll, I'll weigh in on a couple of things here. For, for, I did not know um, this point here that um, the the majority of consumption or pollution is caused by the first 10 percent of the lifespan. Um, that's very interesting. And, and the end, that's very interesting to me and an interesting fact. Um I'm, I'm working on actively an episode on the political orphanage right now on was life better in the 50s? Um, is this is something that I hear from boomers quite a lot, and I want to actually look not at the data for on chicks. it. Um, there's a lot of people that would contend that it was not a great time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I got fascinated by was looking at cars. I think, I think even I get cleaved off on this one. Yeah. I think I think that my 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 skin tone didn't didn't make the yeah. the, the, the the paper bag cut. No one knows what you are, and I want to keep it that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but like, what one of the things that I found interesting it, about it, it gives it was... me a lot more leeway for racist jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, like uh, uh, when, when I started looking at, into cars in the 50s, because they look cool, I'll give them that. Like the, the aesthetics of cars were really cool in the 50s. They were pieces of shit in the 50s. They were absolute garbage. Like the average car, in the, like a high-end car in the 50s had a lifespan of 60 to 80,000 miles. And the, the floorboards were made out of untreated wood, so they would rot. And families would literally put cardboard down. Yeah. They broke down all the fucking time to the point where, like, virtually everybody just had a toolkit in their car. Uh, but again, like, sixty to 80,000 miles was very common. T today in the United States, the cheapest car you can buy is more efficient and more safe and longer lasting than the most expensive car you could have bought in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s. So um, to some extent, listener, you're already living in what you're describing of, of cars lasting much, much longer. Like today, the likelihood of buying a lemon is much lower than it was 20 years ago. Um, and I, I don't know what the average lifespan of a car is now, but um, it's considerably higher than it used to be. Yeah. I mean, most of my cars have lasted over a decade because yeah. I buy a car and I drive it into the ground. Like I don't, I don't need a new yeah. car every few years. My car is six years old. It's not even, I think I have the, the more than six car years left. I bought as an adult. So it was me coming back from New York city. 
uh, where I, I had the same car that my mom sold me like for to go to college in. But the first car I bought as an adult, I had up until Ashley and I decided to just get rid of our cars because we were living in the Bay Area. And thanks to beautiful things like scooters, we could get <laughs> everywhere we needed very, very fast. And also that was at a oh, peak time of VC horseshit where like there were also just cars that you could rent via app like right off the street. I so, liked those cars. Yeah, the little cars, black ones. Gig cars. Yeah. yeah. One time I found a half drank fifth of vodka. <laughs> that sounds right. Nice. <laughs> Carlos by choice writes, I live in New York in the best public uh, transit, ci- the best public transit city in the United States. And even here. People love their cars. The city is in the middle of trying to implement very limited congestion pricing. I believe that that was actually finalized today, actually. The MTA announced that. And every day there are news stories, social media posts of people protesting just how unjust the fees are and lobbying to get their group excluded. Sounds right. Uh, Whenever a new bike lane is proposed that will remove 50 parking spaces, community board meetings become chaos. If we could build better trains, America will still love their cars. It's part of our culture. I think I'm that is... sick of these bullies. I'm <laughs> sick of these fucking bullies that just want to bully people with this car shit. You Disgusting. Know, what this person said is true, but there is some bullying bullshit in here because what I have noticed yeah. is that Fuck these you. car people are incredibly selfish. Right now, the cars have 100% in, of infrastructure in many of the U.S. cities, and they want to keep 100%. No one, not me, not anyone else, is advocating to making cars go away. All we're asking for is to have alternatives. To so make that them more might, expensive and less convenient. Oh, my God, to eliminate the traffic. So even drivers would benefit. But if you go to a city council mm-hmm. meeting and it's you look at an... Ad, shut up, Dawson. <laughs> if you look at an eight-lane road... And we suggest taking one of the eight to have a two-way bike line that would make safe, it would be safe for bikes and for scooters that you love so much and for walking and for all these things. The car people will show up and say, absolutely not. If you want to get rid of some parking spaces, they will say, absolutely not. They want 100% and they want it to be free. And that's what makes me crazy is that anytime you say you want a train that has to be fully paid for, it has to be profitable, God damn it. But Parking spaces should be free. I mean, think about how big a parking space is. You, Andrew, have a nice little camper. Darren has a camper. It fits in a parking space, and it's a fucking house. And so why do these car drivers think that they are entitled to that much free space for their empty machine that they use for maybe an hour a day? Like, the entitlement of drivers makes me crazy. And so it's like, no one's trying to eliminate your cars or your culture or any of that. But you guys don't get 100% and the rest of us get zero. That's what we're fighting against, where it's like people who like trains and safe bike lanes, we should be able to have that too. It's a, it's a more thing, not a taking away from you. I think if you're going to keep the transportation budget the same, I am open to allocating more of it to trains and other forms of transportation. I'm also for making the drivers pay for more of their costs. You should pay for parking. You should pay for bridge congestion. You should pay for these things. Because if I have to buy a train ticket, you should pay for the infrastructure that your car requires. Because people don't pay for their cars. They just don't pay pay for the actual cars. Yes. They pay for the cars. They pay for their gas. So it's not like driving is free. You don't get gifted a car by the state. You get gifted the freeways. You get gifted all of those roles. That is infrastructure for which also, you know, does a, a, a lot of transport for America in terms of goods and services. Yeah, you're right. Okay. That was infrastructure. Look, if you want to kick Eisenhower in the dick on the federal highway system, then that's fine. But uh, uh, again, I'm not saying that we should eliminate all the roads. I'm saying we should add I the think, fucking I, I, think, I think these congestion prices are stupid. And I think the MDA is basically putting it in there so they can continue to not be a, uh, a worthwhile organization. They I, work I, I though. Think I think they're smart, but they'll be deeply unpopular because Too pe- bad. people fucking hate surge pricing. Like, 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 did we, was it on this show or another show I did? It was another show I did where they were talking about how, uh, Wendy's was, was, um, bringing in like happy hour basically is what they were doing. Like yes. they, they were like, we're going to like floated the idea. We, 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 we were, we were thinking about yeah. making yeah, like stupid. hamburgers less expensive during hours of the day where we have less customers, just like happy hour, just like matinees and like people fucking flipped out 
because people are really sensitive to any type of price gouging perceived. Now a classic Kroger commander move. Uh, yeah. Inflation. And so like, like, like the, 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 it makes sense to me that you would do congestion pricing because you're, you're basically doing a Pigalian tax on something that's irritating and you're, you're going look like there's, there's a, we're trying to adjust supply and demand in terms of road usage. Um, so that's me. Like, but I'm also fine with surge pricing on Ubers for the exact same reason. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, but it will be deeply unpopular because like I'm the guy who for years now, is going, hey, uh, price, price gouging laws don't work. They're not a good idea. And then everybody yeah. goes, fuck you. I hate being price gouged. And I'm like, I'm, I'm telling you, this is, you know, so anyway, it won't be popular. The MTA will not get any, any popularity. Yeah, because out of this. drivers think they're entitled to go on the bridge well, and before, get them all of it we, for free. Before we get into the, the, you know, personal sins of the driver, uh, I, I don't think that this will have much of a meaningful effect on actual, if, if what you want is to discourage people from going into certain parts of town, I don't believe that it will necessarily do that. I think it will just raise money for the MTA, which is really bad at managing money. And the subways have gotten progressively worse and the train system has gotten shitty for years. It, That's it, one it of the works in the Bay I Area left, though. Left New York was, I got, it drove me that shit crazy using the subway. One of my good friends is a subway driver, by the way. And like, uh, I asked Jared about this. I was like, like, why is it that the delays are so bad? One of them, unfortunately, is, is probably unavoidable, which is that when you have, I don't, I don't remember the amount of people that use the, the chuds. The ch- no, just like, I, I, don't, I don't recall what the, the data is on how many people use the subway every day. Let's say it's 3 million people. Sure. Like, um, the, we, we designed the subways in such a way that it would be prohibitively expansive or expensive to, to uh, expand them enough now to put in like gates like they've got in Taiwan. And like in Taiwan, there, there's a specific place the subway opens up. There's a gate there. It opens up. You get in. You can't fall on the tracks in Taiwan, at least not in Taipei. It would, we couldn't do that now uh, because it, we would have to rebuild the whole thing from scratch. And so in a system where you've got open tracks, it just takes one idiot to shut the whole thing down. Yeah. And in, in a group of three, three million people using it a day, You're gonna have there, there's going to be idiots. So part of it I, I'm willing to give to the, the New York subway system just based on the fact it's a very large chaotic system. This is an unavoidable issue of scaling. Um, but some of the other elements that are just structural and dumb shit are the MTA board that runs the subway is not actually New York City. It's a state government organization. So like like funding from the MTA was taken from uh, um, who's the guy that left his brother with uh, Tapper? Cuomo. No, no, Cuomo. Cuomo. Thank you, Cuomo. Uh, Governor Cuomo took money out of the MTA's budget for subways to bail out a ski lodge in upstate New York. Because if there's one thing we can't trust the private sector to do, it's to run a fucking ski lodge. Um, and so like, I, I, I think the whole structure of it's insane that they are, yes. that they, they have a, a, a deeply municipal system run by a state agency rather than the city itself. Once every t- uh, 10 years, New York gets really, really, really pissed off about the MTA. And then everybody runs into this particular problem yeah. and they run their head into the wall. And then the MTA comes up with some other cockamamie well, scheme then the, the, to the, either raise prices yeah. or come up in this case with the surge. The, the, thing. the other, the other big problem is that, and this is something I think endemic to government, which is, or you could have it in corporations as well, but this is, this is a government specifically. It, you're more likely to get credit for building a new thing than, than fixing something boring. So if you're on the MTA board and you spearhead a new station to open up in Flatbush or church, you get to have your picture cutting a ribbon in front of it. You built a new thing. Good for you. The, the person that goes and finds the specific railing that's necessary to fix under the underground chamber on the G line, that bit's all boring. So nobody does it. Yeah. So you have more construction and less maintenance. But as for the surge pricing, the idea that it, I mean, it does work. It works in the Bay area, worked in New York with my own behavior. When I, I had a car when I lived in Boston and I would take the mega bus because one of my calculations was it was 20 bucks to take the mega bus. It was 20 bucks just to get over the bridge into New York. And then I didn't even think about parking for just financial reasons. It made more sense for me to take public transportation. Where did it work in the Bay Area? In the Bay Area, every time they raised the bridge prices, oh, we would calculate. Yeah, no, look, yeah, raising, but like, bridge, raising bridge prices are, uh, I think, more of a, at least a standard way. It's unpopular, but it's something that people understand. Yeah. Uh, uh, and this surge is pricing not, was this the is same not way. That. This, is, this is a, there is a zone in New York for which you're going to, uh, uh, I assume through photo enforcement, be charged for being in this certain area of the city. And in I think a car. It's gonna, Yes, in yeah. a car. My, yes. my, my friend Jimmy Fela points out that New York City has the worst traffic in the world, and here's how it you does. know it. Um, bank robbers fucking go on foot. Yeah. That is evidence of real fucking bad traffic if the mm-hmm. bank robbers are on foot. A car uh, takes up a lot of physical space. and I, so I, I understand that you are, are, you are on a holy war with this, but uh, uh, I, I do think that we should probably take a look at this plan specifically before we bless any plan that might be punitive to drivers. Would that be safe to say? Sure. 
I'm fine with that. I I, just... I'm happy to look at plans more than hearing three lines in an email yeah, about them. Exactly. Yes, I, before yeah. I would ever vote to restrict any rights or increase to be funding fair, to something. I, I've read one article about it and saw one angry tweet thread about a New Yorker who was saying that this was not going to do anything but uh, essentially put more money in the pocket of an organization that has proven itself hilariously inept with money. Entirely but I mean, that, this email wasn't really about the congestion pricing. It was more just like cars are part of our, our culture. And all I'm trying to say is no one's trying to eliminate them from the culture. I think what you're saying in terms of driving in New York is, hey, I'm walking here. There you go. <laughs> Austin almost had gondolas, right? Argo Design concocted the concept for Wire One Austin, an 8.7 mile urban cable system proposed to run along South First Street from the University of Texas at Austin down to Slaughter Lane. The proposed <laughs> system identified 19 stopped, uh, stops along the route. Uh, the emailer writes, I voted for Project Connect, which was a, a modern system that would uh, in increase this uh, a connection between uh, Austin, including a light rail. But this is a cool what if scenario. You know, what, what's funny is I, I had this same thought, probably not as well executed, but I did uh, City Week on the political orphanage a year ago. Um, I, I am uh, a dilettante at best when it comes to urban planning, but I find it fascinating. There's so much cool stuff in urban planning. People have been trying to make gondolas. This was 2012. People have been trying to make <laughs> gondolas happen for well, fucking so, 12 so I, I, I would take the gondola. I, I brought on, and I, I forget his name, which is a shame because he's a really nice guy, but he runs a, a, a YouTube channel called City Beautiful, uh, and he is an urban des he's an urban designer, not an urban planner. Uh, I was um, somewhat... Uh, uh, Saddened to learn there was a distinction between the two because all of my questions for him were about urban planning and not urban design, but he, he played ball with me all the same. Uh, and one of the things that I proposed to him was like, why don't we put in a ski lift in Austin? Uh, because um, like right now, anywhere in an urban environment, expanding train lines is, is a nightmare because you're having to use eminent domain to get so much land that it, it just, at some point, it becomes uh, insurmountable either legally or financially. But either not way, if you take away car lanes on freeways. Uh, oh, perhaps, perhaps so, perhaps so. <laughs> but if you were making a new one that cross cut yeah, yeah, like existing sure. housing and things, it's very, very difficult, right? So I was like, why don't you just put in um, like ski lifts because you, you wouldn't have to like reappropriate, like you'd, you'd have to put down basically a lamppost or, or like, like a really big lamppost, right? Um, his rejoinder to me, because I was envisioning what we used to have at the Oklahoma City Zoo where you just get in like an actual ski lift and he yeah. was like, um, can people drop things? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, on pedestrians? <laughs> and I was like, I guess theoretically. And he's like, could some drunk person theoretically fall off? And I was like, mm, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. So you, if you were to do this, and he's like, also like, does Texas get hot? And I was like, I have thoughts. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, so I, I think to make this work, you'd have to have an enclosed gondola, like one of those really ritzy ski lodge type things that has like you can't drop or fall out of. But I think it's a good idea working with limited spaces. because Like you on the it, Las Vegas Ferris wheel? Yes, or like the London Eye, something like that, yeah. where where you could you could actually intersperse it over existing areas without having to bulldoze them, like yeah. in the same way that you can put like uh, wind power turbines on existing farmland without getting rid of all the farmland. So that makes sense to me. I probably would have voted for that. In Zagreb, Croatia, we were on the shortest incline uh, ever. It's the world's shortest incline. So it's one of those incline things. So you get A funicular. In. Uh, uh, the, the, the thing that goes like me the funicular where it's, where it's like, like a little staircase that goes up a hill basically. Yeah. Funiculars. You don't barely, see a lot of those. Barely a story and a half of stairs. <laughs> it's like <laughs> way more time to get into it and get out of it than just walking the stairs. But it was adorable. Every day they shoot a cannon and that shit is loud in Zagreb. Why would they do that? To celebrate a time when they shot a cannon and, Something happened. They shoot a cannon every day in Edinburgh at one o'clock. It's yeah. a it's an old nautical thing to let uh, uh, guys in the harbor know that it's one o'clock. And because the Scots are thrifty, they do it at one instead of noon, because you only have to shoot one cannon then. And then they just kept doing it because it's mm. a thing. It scares the piss out of tourists. Uh, yeah, we were there one time. The cannon guy is very popular. He waves to his adoring <laughs> fans uh, uh, right after. He I would the think cannon. that's the best job to get in, like yeah. the, the municipal government of Zagreb. Yeah, no, it's pretty good. How about the Andrew Heaton Sports Question of the Week? Heaton, what are your thoughts on the chalk method for building a bracket? I feel like there's no point of making your own bracket if you're using chalk. Uh, I can. I think I see where you're coming from, but I disagree on this. I don't think chalk makes a good building material for anything, including a bracket. It's something you use for marking things, but trying to build a bracket out of chalk, I, I, I don't think it would work very so well. So you don't, you don't think, you know, because... The favorites are the favorites for a reason. You don't think that using chalk is 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 a good idea? 
No, I think we, in our culture, good question, Justin. Yeah. Uh, um, I think in our culture, we, we, uh, overemphasize the quote unquote favorites. You know, when you go to a professional NBA game, sure. You know, just like a, a, a regular dude like you and me mm -hmm. drinking our beer, you know, our, yep. our light domestic beer. Yep. We, and we go to one of these games, um, you know, when you watch it on the TV mm -hmm. and, and, and they, they've got the cameras, they're always focusing on Larry Bird. Or, or Michael Jordan, Often right? Times. Uh, yeah. And so you're watching it, and you'd think the whole game's about them if you're watching the TV. But you go and watch the game, and you're like, oh, there's this whole group of dudes playing, and maybe women. And they're all playing at the same time. And when you're there in person, and you're there enjoying the thrill of the crowd in the moment, you know that it's not favorites. But, it's but, a team. But specifically, like when Michael Jordan was on the University of North Carolina, or Great when Larry Bird was, was on Indiana... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was a reason why they were a favorite and why people might, might use chalk. You know, I'm close friends with Larry Bird and he, he would, he would disagree with you. He would disagree. Really? I think your interpretation to that event is, is different than the guy that was in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Larry Bird's welcome to counteract me on that. If he wants to come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Great basketball player, Larry Bird. Relevant, relevant example, Heaton. True. True. He's that's such an old reference. He's already <laughs> not been a coach for like a decade. <laughs> Is he he's still alive? I believe so. Good yeah. for him. Good for him. Yeah. Judge this right. Sotomayor is Loki the second best justice on the court right now on civil rights. Could be. I don't know. Um like uh, I I think uh Court reporting is pretty much garbage in this country, and we tend to treat the justices like they are blue team, red team players. Um, the, the bonus episode that I'm doing on the political orphanage this week is on the recent uh, Trump Colorado ballot decision that we've previously discussed on this yep. program. Um, do you all recall what the break was on that, how, how they ended up voting on it? Unanimous. Yeah, Jen, I know. Jen knocked it out of the park. Um, some of the media outlets that we were discussing earlier today would not have described it that way. They would have said it was a partisan split decision between the Republicans really? and the Democrats. It was nine and zero. Once again, there, Jen has yes, knocked there, it was, out of the there, park. There, with, yeah, yeah. There, there were there were articulated points on they, specifically they, they the had wording of the decision. opinions. Yeah. So that is to say, like, but if, it was a nine zero vote. It was a nine zero vote where they went. I I broadly I, I agree with the decision enough to vote for them. However, I have concerns. It's an, a, a concurring opinion is like an asterisk in yeah. jurisprudence, right? Um, uh, like I think you'd find that there are there are justices that you might think are uh, hardcore Republicans, except for this one issue. Turns out they're very like like the the, the recent um, uh, decision that that declared half of eastern Oklahoma uh, Native American territory. That was Neil Gorsuch that yeah. that wrote the majority decision on that. Right? If that's if that's some sort of you know re Republicans don't like the Indians or they're racist or whatever, you wouldn't have thought Neil Gorsuch would do it. So anyway, point is, I'm not surprised to hear this. I don't know the judges' positions on civil rights. That's not something that I've paid specific attention to. But it wouldn't surprise me what the combination it's is. It's a very subjective it. statement. Yeah, yeah. Spoken like a real Federalist Society plant. <laughs> <laughs> Landmark Green Energy Bill Enjoyer writes, I work in the biofuels industry and work a lot with trade organizations and with many of the regulatory agencies that affect the industry. Anyway, I'll cut to the chase. The rollout for the Inflation Reduction Act has been an absolute shit show. <laughs> I won't get into specifics, but essentially the IRA created a ton of tax credits and other incentives, but it didn't define anything and shrugged and dumped it all on the Treasury. The Treasury doesn't know any of this shit, so they've been working with stakeholders, and, well, no one can agree on anything anything, which is just dragging this process out. Multiple things that were supposed to be rolled out in 2023 are still being debated at Treasury, an absolute nightmare. I feel like this debate should have been handled in the legislature rather than behind a veil at Treasury where lobbyists on all sides are trying to get their pet projects funded. I complain about this all the time on Congressional Dish when I read bills and what they do is they say, we're going to create this hmm. new system. But it's going to be the Secretary of Homeland right. Security or the mm -hmm. Secretary of Health and Human Services or the Treasury. They're going to make all the actual yeah. rules. And that, it, I mean, it's a problematic for two things. Because, like, you're supposed to be the decision makers in the legislature, but you're not actually making any decisions. So that's a problem. And by leaving it just, like, up to the executive branch, it can be changed every four years. Um, if something even gets off the ground. Like, one of my concerns right now, like, let's go back to the car chargers. There are things that the Biden administration has been working on since the Inflation Reduction Act passed at the end of the last Congress. They had two years to get it in place. They might not get it done in time. And then by that time, you might have a Trump administration who doesn't want to get it done at all. And then it all comes to a screeching halt. So it's like the fact that Congress doesn't do their jobs in these bills more often than not 
is something we should be more angry about, except that the American people are not aware of it because we don't have a media that actually focuses on what ends up in these bills and these laws. But this is so common and it is it's infuriating because they really should be telling the law enforcers like this is exactly what we expect you to do. They leave way too many of the the decisions and the design of these new programs up to all of the executive branch agents. I'd like to offer a rejoinder. Oh! To Jim. Jim, well, you're not understanding about the system that we've got here. Is this? Let's say I'm a congressman from oh, Mississippi. Somebody. <laughs> I vote in favor of giving these powers I'm going to delegate to the EPA so I can go back home to my constituents and say I voted for clean air. Now, inevitably, when that clean air cuts into corporate profits, I can then go, the goddamned EPA is anti-business. So the thing, yeah. Jim, what yep. you're missing here is this is a real good thing for congressmen to do, to have their cake and eat it too. We get the credit, but we don't have to deal with any of the consequences. So it's a good system. It's a good system. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, we want to thank Senator Jowles for being on the show, <laughs> uh, Democrat for Mississippi. <laughs> There, there's, there's also the other thing that happens, too. This could be an apocryphal story, I, but I've, I've heard it when I was in D.C. several times, and it, it, it is certainly emblematic of another thing that happens. Um, if, if, it, if it's not specific, it's emblematic of a phenomenon that happens where um, Congress just went, hey, rather than directing funding to the Department of the Interior, we're just going to give the Department of Interior a lump sum. You figured out. You're the experts. So what did the Department of the Interior do? Immediately shut down the Washington Monument and put up a sign that said, due to congressional budget cuts, we are unable to run this. Write your congressman. So like, like, like agencies have their own methods of, um, well, we're going to use congressional in, in transigence to shut down things to get more money. Like a, a few years ago, you had like the, the, the park system, this might have been under Zinke, I can't remember. There was some budgetary dispute that, that Congress hadn't done, and so the park system like actively put up uh, 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 traffic blockers around the parks. So like you couldn't use them. Like you don't have to plug in the electricity or anything. They actively yeah. blocked it. So, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, Congress should do its job. Uh, an ideological legend of the We're Not Wrong podcast using the analogy uh, that a, a the helicopter of government is working. It's just dumb pilots who want to do loop-de-loops with it, right? Jen believes that helicopter pilots who need to stop doing loop-de-loops, and if they don't, they should be replaced. Heaton believes that helicopter pilots are incentivized to do loop-de-loops by federal regulators, so we should disable the loop-de-loop features on helicopters. And Justin wants Jen and Heaton to fight about the solution loudly to drive traffic to the podcast, and he also wants to do loop-de-loops in a fucking helicopter. Uh, I love this. I'll, you're not, right you're not wrong. If, if, you're I, not wrong. if, I, if I can <laughs> tweak it slightly, I, like, I'm very much a structuralist. I think if you take um, uh, good people and you put them in bad structures, bad outcomes happen. So I think you've got to figure out yeah. what, what the incentive structure is. And a lot of the time, that's federal I'd like you to take this metaphor more seriously. <laughs> yeah. I love the metaphor. I love I'd the like, metaphor. I'd like you to take it more seriously. Uh, We're Not Wrong is a production of Dog and Pony Show Audio. Our editor is Will Saddleberg. On PX3 this week, we have an interview with... Dave Leventhal of Raw Story talking about the death of small dollar donations, or at least its waning power as we enter into this 2024 cycle. And on Friday's edition, if you are curious from somebody who is working in the progressive sphere as to how issues are best not only shaped, but what an actual person who is doing uh, research in the field right now in swing states are hearing from double haters or no-nos, as uh, she calls them, uh, then Friday's episode with Annette Shankar Osario is the PX3 to listen to. Jen, do you hear thunder? Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, it. there's there's a there's a advisory. I left my right windows now. rolled down, so I'm going to take a quick break when we're done with this to roll my <laughs> oh, windows well, back how about again. You, how, about you talk, how about you talk right now, and then you can run? Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know what? A uh, fun episode on the political orphanage this week, but what I'm going to plug is a new show that I'm doing with Rex Williams of the Whiskey Tribe hey. that just came out. It is called Would You Touch It? Mm-hmm. On Would You Touch It? <laughs> on YouTube, Rex and I sit down, and there is a magical button between us, and Rex asks a question like, Hey, Heaton, if you touch this button, aliens land tonight. Would you touch it? Or Heaton, if you touch this button, everyone in the world instantly gets superpowers. Do you want to live in a world where even bad guys have superpowers if good guys have superpowers? So it's a very good conversational uh, show with two of your favorite drunks. A game of unintended consequences. <laughs> you love to see it. Heaton, go take yeah, care of your, 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 sock, your soaking wet car. Uh, Jen. 
The dish. Yes, I have nothing new it? on the dish because it's my birthday week and I gave hey. myself time off. Also, they just funded the government six months late with thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. So I have to fucking figure out how to deal with that. But in the meantime, um, in the beginning of this show, I did mention a podcast episode that I listened to this morning with mm-hmm. Nicole Shanahan. And so what that is, it is the today issue Today's the 27th of March. Uh-huh. Um, it's the Tay episode of Tetragrammaton with Rick Rubin. And she did most of the talking, and I learned quite a bit about her. Rick and where Rubin, she came from. The, the music producer? I could not tell you. I know very little about this person. I, <laughs> I looked up Nicole he, Shanahan. That's why I found this. No, it's just a... Yeah. There's no face With on Rick. Ru- I don't know another Rick Rubin, but there's yeah. there's a it's very Denver famous Denver Broncos music producer. colors in the um yeah the icon. He's kind of a weird hippie. I could not figure out anything about this host, but I also didn't care because I was in it for, Nicole, in it for Nicole Shanahan, and it was it was a good interview. I learned more about her and kind of how she yeah. thinks, so I recommend it. There we go. Go listen to it. Till next time for Andrew Heaton and Jen Branny. I'm Justin Robert Young, reminding you, dear listener and viewer. We're not wrong.